was you. It wasn't me. We read about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and its importance and what's coming for us. 1 Corinthians 15, we're beginning in verse 50. The Apostle Paul says, Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised, and perishable, we will be changed. For this, this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written in Isaiah 25, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, Paul applies. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word as we reflect on the fact that our toil is not in vain in the Lord. It's exactly what Jesus says in John 15, 5, which we're studying in the Upper Room Discourse, where Jesus teaches that that which is done while abiding in him is fruit, and that which is done not abiding in him is nothing. And it's good to keep those things in mind. Uh, let's make sure we're abiding in Christ in fellowship with him, depending on him, connected to him, and not disobeying him. When we disobey God through personal sin, which includes those things that we do that he said not to do, and those things that he said to do that we didn't do, we need to confess those sins. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is not something that I think you should just be willy-nilly about. I think it's something you should be intentional in terms of your relationship with God. Whenever you've thought, said, or done that is contrary to his character, you need to confess. Let's take a moment, and I'll give you... Uh, some time for silent prayer and we'll open in prayer. Our Father, we pause to reflect on your kindness to us, your grace, and how you've let us see something of your glory. Uh, we don't deserve to know you. We don't deserve the victory that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. We haven't even uh, fought, but he has won it for us, and we praise you for the privilege we have of following in his steps, of following the example he set, indeed toiling in the Lord. And we know that it's valuable to you when it's done in dependence on him. And now we depend on your provision, Father, your spirit to train us, to help us think your thoughts, to cause the word of Christ richly to dwell within us, that we can uh, fulfill the purpose that you have for us. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. So tonight, uh, we're going to apply a little bit of what we learned in the Upper Room Discourse in John chapter 15, where the Lord Jesus talks about uh, life and life's experiences. He talks about the works that he has, the disciples, that they're going to do. The fruit is how he describes it in the vine and branches illustration. And uh, he says... In verse 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he lifts up, and every branch that bears fruit, he cleans or prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. And then the command, abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he, it doesn't say if anyone doesn't bear fruit, very important. If you do abide in him, you will bear fruit. If you don't abide in him, you won't. But the way he describes it is if anyone doesn't abide in me, he's thrown away as a branch and dries up. And it's literally he's thrown away like the branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire and it is burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, now here comes the, the heavy artillery, the promises of what can come from a life of bearing fruit. If, my wor if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. The principle of successful prayer for the church age believer established by Jesus in John 15, 7. My Father is glorified by this. That's the purpose of all this. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and not proved to be my disciples and become my disciples. 
It doesn't, the word prove is nowhere here. It doesn't imply a proof or some, some showcasing. There is a coordination, a two thing, a two step thing, or two, two results that glorify the Father. One is that we would bear much fruit, and that's an, a continuous portrayal. And one is a summary description that you be, be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you, so abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and I abide in his love. So the relationship described between the Father and the Son is now parlayed for the Son to us. And if we do this, these things I've spoken to you, Jesus says, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. I'd like to apply this, both sessions tonight, what we've read, in uh, two ways. First, I'd like to describe um, a key application, and we'll summarize it this way. Your life matters. Your life matters. And that's what the scriptures are indicating in part here in John 15. And we are communicating an application from the word of God. And most people who will hear that message, your life matters, will say, well, yeah, duh, of course my life matters. The question that this study will ask is why? What about your life matters? Why does your life matter? Sometimes we come, uh, come to life with uh, a, a, a kind of a hopelessness, wondering what's it all about, Just floundering around looking for a reason to continue. What is this life really for? Um, maybe that's uh, gripped you from time to time. As we go along a little ways in life, maybe we uh, wonder um, if, uh, if we're really going to be successful. If, um, if we're going to make the dent that we want to make, will we have the significance that we would like to have? And then, of course, there's the, the question of, do I really enjoy my life? Am I enjoying what I'm here for? Read in John 15, 11, that Jesus tells us the things about our fruit production and our success in relation to the Father and the Son so that we'll have his joy and our joy will be brought to its full ex- fullest expression, to its completion. Our, your, boy, your, your joy will be made full. And uh, we wonder, I mean, I'm not really liking what I'm seeing. So you have the summary problem of what's life about. You have the question of significance and the question of enjoyment. And all these questions uh, really uh, are on our minds. They're on the minds of the people around us. They're driving, in terms of motivation, a lot of the decisions people make. Why do you do what you do? And I think the Bible very handily answers these questions about significance and joy and the purpose of life. And my summary statement from what I read in John 15 about you being a branch designed to bear fruit is that your life matters. It matters uh, very much and according to the Word of God. But first, let's talk about what's common to everyone. We all have common ground on this, that your life matters to you. Your life matters to you. Even people who uh, will act as though their life doesn't matter they tend to do so because of some great disappointment about how much it did matter. See, everybody thinks this way. Everybody thinks their life matters, even if they end their life. They think it matters. It's, it, it matters so much that I can't bear the pain, so I have to, you know, that kind of reasoning. Everyone automatically thinks this way. You don't have to argue th- this with people. You don't have to, our, our experience tells us this, and your experience is telling you what's true by God's design. The reason we fight for that last gasp of air, the reason we fight to continue in this life, and the reason it's this natural sort of instinctive thing we do to, to, to try to do whatever it takes to carve out more life is because that's how we've been made. And I'm just trying to, to draw the bridge between everybody and what the Bible's saying. Your life does matter. It matters very much. In fact, it matters all the way to the point of the cross. For the Lord Jesus Christ, as we'll see. Our feelings tell us our life matters. Our desires, a little bit different from your feelings, what you really want in this life tells you your life matters. And I think this is part of how you can examine the broken image of God in sinful and fallen man. Now, what we do with our design in a life that matters is we take it and corrupt it and say, my life matters for me. But that's the, that's the broken part, and that's what we're going to get to. The Bible tells you your life matters to you in Leviticus 19.18 when in the Old Testament, Israel is called to love one another, love your neighbor as yourself. 
Love your neighbor as yourself. And that means, in the Hebrew, that means that you love the other person like you take care of yourself, you take care of the other person. There's no basis for the Leviticus 19.18, which Jesus says, in part, summarizes the entire Mosaic law. Love God, Deuteronomy 6, and love your neighbor as yourself, when Jesus summarizes the law. There's no basis for this law, love your neighbor as yourself, unless there is the the taking care of oneself. It's universal. Everybody thinks in terms of self-interest this way. So what? Well, it's echoed in the New Testament as well. We have the command of the Apostle Paul for husbands to love their wives. Remember that one, guys? And in Ephesians 5, 28, he says, So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. There's no illustration of Christ and the church and Christian marriage without this concept of taking care of yourself. Because why? Why do we, why do we think we uh, have a need to do such a thing? We think we need to do this because... Uh, our life matters, and we are, we're made with this need. The scriptures say that God has set eternity into the heart of man. And so the Bible even tells you that your life matters to you. Why would we ever conclude otherwise from our experiences? We wouldn't, but the Bible is agreeing with what you already think, what the world already thinks. And this is an important line of continuity between you and the unbeliever. Your life matters. You were made in God's image. Of course it matters. Your life matters to you, but not for you. This is where the Bible turns and makes a surprising change, of course, from the way we and the world tend to think. The way everybody, I mean the world, tends to think about life is that it is for me. Freedom is for me to go have fun, to go be free, to go do what I want to do. I have life. I have another day. I can take breaths and go serve myself. And that's the old sin nature. That's the fall. That's man for man instead of man for God. Your life is not important in the sense of you being your own. Our sin nature tries to convince us that we are all there is, doesn't it? It tries to convince us that what we can see is all that can be seen. What we know is all that can be known. What we can conclude and rationalize is all that can be reasoned. And so the lie is that you matter because of you. You matter for your own sake. It's not good enough. We're fallen. We're broken. We're destructive. We hurt other people. The best of us hurts the the people closest to us. The best and brightest of every civilization very often will go uh, fight for the war department of whatever civilization so that that civilization can continue. Why? Because people are bad and broken and sinful and wars have to happen and some people need killing. Mankind and man's history since the fall has shown us that if it was about us, that would be insufficient for us to have value. We're broken. The, The environmental movement that tries to propose that man is the problem is right, but they don't like the biblical notion that man is the problem in a very long, big picture way. We, we, kill, we, we put the whole universe under a curse through sin and submit it to the serpent, to the creature instead of the, to the creator. And so the, I, the whole idea that your life is about you is one of the great errors, one of the great internal things that we conclude on our own without any outside advice that has to be um, actually gotten out of us. That's one of those things that the Word has to come in and make the, make the transformation. My life, your life, it's not about us. And that's a direct application of John 15. Look at John 15, 8, where the Lord Jesus Christ, let me flip back to it. That's right, it just fell right open. John 15, 8, my Father is glorified by this, by, what, by you having successful prayer, by you bearing fruit, by you being my disciples. His instructions are not just so the disciples have a good life. That's not a sufficient basis for any kind of encouragement if you want to be a biblical about your approach to life. There's no encouragement in you get your glory. The encouragement is that your life has an eternal purpose in the glory of God. Your life matters, but not for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Remember the illustration in John 15 vine, that's Jesus, branches, that's you and me to bear fruit, the fruit-bearing part of the vine, and the Father, the vine dresser. 
In that, in that picture, the whole purpose, as we said, is for, for the grape harvest, that the branch would bear grapes. Nobody looks at a vineyard and says, man, those are some awesome branches. What we say is that's some good wine. That's, that's a good grape crop we got. Uh, look at the bumper crop of this vine dresser really knows how to, to produce grapes. That vine is a healthy plant, and those branches are bearing as they should. Nobody thinks of, oh, well, I'm going to go to the winery and see the branches. And that's the illustration in John 15. Our life matters. There, there's no grapes without the branches. But it's not for the branches' sake. It's for the fruit, and the fruit is for the vine dresser. See, the Bible presents the alternative to our default setting of arrogance that makes us think it's about us. The Bible says, no, you're here for a greater purpose than you even. As awesome as you are in God's design as his image, there's more to it than just you. There's God whose image you are, uh, you are whose reflection you have been designed to be. And so your life, instead of being about you, becomes about him, and now we're worshiping. We recognize it's not about me, it's about him. I'm going to worship the creator. We're not here for ourselves. We're not here, we're not here for our satisfaction. We're not here for our comfort. We're not here for any of those things. In fact, if pruning is in view in verse 2, for the branch that is already bearing fruit has to be cleaned or pruned, that sounds painful to me. Some of you uh, will get to verse 3 and say, well, the word is what prunes us. That's right. That can be painful too, right? As you sit there and have to take this in and then be held accountable for living it. It's uncomfortable. And that's the design. It isn't about our comfort, but it is going to result ultimately in our joy. Your life matters for sure. It matters to you, and it should. It matters, but not for you. And so you have one life to live. Pardon the, the cliche, but you do. You just have one shot at this before you are held accountable for how you did it. We need to line up on the target. We need to figure out what life is about, and we need to, to hold a steady aim and get a good, get a good outcome. Very short this time of our sojourn on earth. But your life matters to God. That's really an important thing. It doesn't just matter to you. It matters to God. And it matters more to God than it does to you, no matter how hung up on yourself you might be. It's funny. Our life matters more to our Creator than it could ever matter to us. And I'll show you. It's on hanging on the cross of Calvary. And we celebrate this with every day of our lives, living in the shadow of the cross in the light of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us in His death and resurrection. See, we know from the special revelation of Scripture that we matter to God even more than we can imagine for ourselves, and the picture ultimately is the cross. First of all, you matter to God in the way he made you. Genesis 1.26 says God made man to rule over the entire creation, over the, the, the animals and land and uh, various uh, elements of creation on planet Earth. That's our dominion mandate in Genesis 1.26. Male and female, he made them in order to, to, to have dominion, to rule over what God had created. And then you have, in, for example, you can read Proverbs chapter 8. talks about wisdom as, a, as, a, as the skill, the, the helper that enabled God to create. And why did he do it? Because wisdom delights in men, delights in the creature, in man, the ultimate creature on planet Earth. And so the whole of the Earth is designed to house the delight of the wisdom of God. That would be us. And when you realize that God is just saying, I delight in mankind, it's my delight to make them, we understand our value is much greater than our own delight in ourselves because you are much less, I'm much less than God, right? Infinitely less. So me delighting in something, that's great, but God infinitely being God, delighting in us, makes us ask with David, who is man that God would take notice of us? We're just, God knows our friend, we're merely dust. And yet he takes account he considers us and that starts to give you an idea it start once you realize the difference between you and god and that god has taken an interest in you greater than your own in yourself because of who he is you start to realize that um, there can be no it's a it's a it's a horrible substitute what man does in his arrogance to to think it's about him what a what a waste who are we we're we're that broken thing that kills each, kills each other, hurts each other. God, righteous and loving, infinitely righteous and loving, who is only performing perfect righteousness and goodness in all that he does and says, has you in mind and in his plan and is 
working all things together for good to the to the you who love him who are called according to his purpose according to romans 8 28 so just the idea that god takes an interest in us means that um, there's got to be something may, way better than we living for ourselves we matter we all know it we matter to ourselves our lives matter um, but not for us it's for a higher purpose and so when you start to realize that you matter to God, it's, it all kind of, kind of comes into focus. I think the greatest manifestation of your importance as a creature in God's design is the cross, what Jesus did for you at the cross. And we read about especially the motivation for the cross in Romans 5, 8. God commends his love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's his love that motivates that. And that's his special concern for we who didn't deserve it. In John 3.16, the same thing, for God so loved the world. You know that that means you when you read the world, and Jesus died for the sins of the world. And so your life matters, and I'll prove it to you, to God, because he loves you and sent his son to die for you. And when you start to evaluate the sacrifice of what happened at the cross, and you start thinking about what the Bible is saying about God, eternal God, taking on flesh, so that he could die in your place, and the Father sacrificing the Son in that transaction and the son doing that because he loved you and he loved the father the father doing that because he loved you and he loved the son and that all being God's design for your redemption when you start to realize the application of the cross in terms of your importance your significance what God has in mind you realize we can't even begin to understand our role in all this we can't even begin to see uh, to, to, we have no feeling or, or perspective to really calibrate what this is like in God's estimation. What we can say is, we must worship. See, um, you matter to God. Your life matters to God. I can prove it to you in John 15 because two reasons. One, uh, you've got a purpose to bear fruit. And he wants that fruit. It matters to him. Another thing, he wants you to enjoy it. That's verse 11. You need to every time the serpent or his minions in the world start saying something about how God doesn't want you to enjoy. God is holding back the goodies, like, he, like the serpent told the woman in Genesis chapter 3. Remember John 15, 11. I'm telling you these things. The word of God that Jesus has and all the New Testament is an extrapolation, expansion on what Jesus is doing and teaching his disciples. It's, in other words, Jesus is teaching through the entire New Testament. I'm telling you these things so that your joy may be, my joy may be in you. The thing that makes my life have flavor and enjoyment, that you could have that same joy. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a much better deal than anything the world could offer. And so that your joy can be brought to its fullest expression, be made full. Finally, on the question of your life mattering, your life matters for God, for God. Your life matters to you. you. Everybody knows it. Your life matters not for you. It matters to God according to the scriptures and it matters for him. That's what gives it its significance. And you can see I'm playing around with prepositional phrases a little bit here. When we talk about your life mattering for God, remember he made you as his vice gerents, as his rulers in his place. Whatever he's entrusted to you, according to Romans 13, all authority proceeds from God. It's a delegation. Whenever you have something that is yours to take care of and you have the freedom to either obey him with it or disobey him with it, when you find yourself in that position, he's saying you're important. You're important enough in my design that you get to choose what to do with this outcome. Now, this is not an arrogance thing. It's arrogant to deny this, to deny man's importance and put us in some sort of, um, you know, arrogant version of humility because it denies the scriptures this is the only real humility it's directed toward god that he has us as exactly as he has us he has us no more or less important than he made us and our our importance is directly tied to his glory that's that's john 15 8 in his design for our uh, fulfillment of our prayers for example john 15 7 if you abide in me and my words abide in you ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you you get your prayer requests answered Wow, well, that's great news, Jesus. I'm glad that he's going to answer my prayers. Keep reading. This glorifies my Father. It's not for us. Ultimately, it's for God. And yet we get maximum joy in verse 11. This is, this is a biblical perspective on who and what we are. And Jesus is giving us that. He has the same perspective in terms of his humanity. 
Because Jesus was, submitted himself all the way to the Father's will, all the way to the, through the death of the cross, he was also highly exalted, given a name above every name in Philippians 2. And this pattern that Jesus has is our pattern. And so when we see that our life, like Jesus, has significance, importance, as it relates to God's glory, now we understand what we're here for. Now we see why, even if it hurts, I still must submit and glorify because I'm being told I'm worthy to suffer for his sake. We read about that in Philippians 1.29. The Philippians who are successful believers and have not done anything to incur the wrath of God in terms of their Christian walk, who are not being under divine discipline, for to you it has been granted, says Paul, for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. See, the Bible is full of a picture for Christians that normal Christians, normative, biblically minded, serving the Lord, Christians who see that our importance comes from God and no other place, that they're going to suffer. But that's another part of that importance. You get to be in the pattern of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you get to glorify your heavenly father when you walk in that pattern. I think that the most important way you can see that your life matters for God is in the incarnation itself. David wrote, what is man that God takes notice of me long before Jesus took on flesh and dwelt among us, long before the son of God became Jesus the Christ. When we put those two ideas together, that not only is David in, in a, a proper frame of humility recognizing God is God and we are not, and then God took on flesh and became one of us in the incarnation. When you understand what is involved in God getting you for himself, you see, that, that gives you that eternal perspective that, wow, uh, my life in the Lord Jesus Christ for the glory of God matters. And you have a message now for your friends. You have a message for the world. You have a message for everybody because it coincides with what we already think, but it contradicts it too. We already think we matter. We just think we matter in a wrong way, in a much lesser way than we do. In our broken fallenness and our sin sinfulness, we think we matter for ourselves, which is not enough. You really take notice of who and what you are. It's not good enough. But your life matters forever. What you're going to do with your choices right now every moment of every day, and the power of the Holy Spirit is going to bring glory to God at the judgment seat of Christ, an eternal reward of inheritance for you as you've been called out to rule with Christ. That's the ultimate significance of your choices. However many choices, however long you get to make choices, that's what they're for. They're not for anything less.